Economic growth, as measured by GDP, is, is really something fairly recent in time. It, if you look back over the last couple of thousand years, uh, even though empires were rising and falling, not much was happening in terms of global GDP uh, until we get to the last 200 years. Why so? Well, what changed over the last 200 years? We gained access uh, to fossil fuels. We had been using uh, renewable energy up to that time at relatively stable rates, and the amount that, was, that we were able to harvest from the environment was, was relatively limited. But with fossil fuels, we gained access to energy supplies created over the course of tens of millions of years uh, through natural processes in which we had to invest no effort whatsoever. Uh, fossil fuels are energy dense and uh, have been incredibly inexpensive compared to the, the economic benefit they, they yield. Uh, and energy, after all, is what enables us to do things. Uh, energy is not just a part of the economy. Energy is the economy. So with uh, cheap fossil fuels, we were able to create economic growth as had never occurred before in human history. Uh, however, nothing grows forever on a finite planet. A um, simple example would be um, a hamster. A newborn hamster doubles its weight every week. It's growing very rapidly. But how big a hamster would we have if that proverbial hamster, baby hamster, kept doubling its body weight every week for one year? Would it be a 50-pound hamster or a 100-pound hamster? Well, the answer actually is it would be a nine billion ton hamster. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's never happened, never will happen because it, it, on a finite planet, growth does not go on forever in, in any uh, quantity. So it, it should have been clear that uh, the treadmill of economic growth would, uh, would come to an end at some point. And in fact, we, we received a clear warning um, four decades ago with the publication of this book, Limits to Growth, which went on to become the best-selling environmental book of all time. I read it in uh, 1972 when it came out. I was 21 years old, and it really shaped my whole adult life because I realized for the first time in, in my young life that, that the global economy was on an unsustainable track. And when I say unsustainable, I don't mean not eco-groovy. I mean it's something that can't go on much longer. Uh, the, the Limits to Growth study, of course, was carried out by a team of uh, scientists at MIT looking at the likely interactions between population growth, resource depletion, and the uh, uh, environmental pollution from industrial processes. And their, their standard run scenario tended to show uh, a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. Well, here we are in the first couple of decades of the 21st century, and, uh, and I would argue that we are seeing uh, world economic growth coming to an end in real time all around us, and the signs are everywhere. Uh, now, the, the limiting factors that, uh, that were studied back in 72 included, included uh, population, resources, and, uh, and the ability of the environment to absorb uh, industrial waste products. Uh, as it's actually turning out, there's another factor that, that is at least as important as, as those which wasn't taken into account then, which is debt. Um, <clears throat> why debt? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century, the beginning of the, of the uh, economic growth uh, boom. The biggest problem at that time, actually, ironically, was overproduction. With cheap fossil fuels, we could make so much stuff so fast, people couldn't absorb it all. We solved that problem in, in a couple of ways. One was advertising, talking people into, into wanting more stuff than they otherwise would. And then consumer credit, making it easier for people to go into debt to buy stuff that now they wanted as a result of advertising. Uh, <clears throat> debt is a way of pushing consumption forward in time. Consume now, pay later. Uh, and so it's been a way of increasing uh, consumption uh, in the 1980s, in this country, we reached a turning point, which actually in, in many other countries either has happened or, or is happening, with the beginning of globalization. Um, 
here in highly industrialized nations, wages stagnated because American industrial workers were now competing with workers on the other side of the planet. Uh, but consumption still needed to grow in order to keep the economy growing. If, uh, by this time, the economy is depending upon growth. Even the, the financial system is depending on growth, the monetary system, because it's all based on, on debt. Money is debt, after all. It may sound a little strange the first time you think of it that way, but all money is debt. And debt is, in, in our current financial system becomes money. If you go into the bank and take out a loan for $10,000, the banker doesn't just search around in the vault and find 10,000 that somebody else deposited. That money is created in your account at the moment the loan is made. When the loan is repaid, the $10,000 ceases to exist. But because of the necessity of payment of interest on debt, this is a requirement that the total amount of debt continuously grow. We have made economic growth a requirement for the health of our economies. So if the salaries of, of industrial workers are not increasing as a result of globalization, how do we keep consumption still growing? Well, we did that by increasing debt faster than GDP in every year for the past uh, 30 or 40 years, which has resulted in the financialization of the economy. The financial industry, therefore, which creates and handles debt has grown faster than any other aspect of the economy, manufacturing, farming, whatever. And so it's, it's looked kind of like this. And you see at the very end, the, the graph changes in trajectory pretty significantly. That's what happened in 2008. Since 2008, the government in this country and many other countries around the world has become the borrower and spender of last resort in order to keep the economy from imploding upon itself because we've reached a natural limit to the amount of growth of debt that consumers can take on. Once consumers are all loaned up, then they can't afford to make payments on the debt that they have and banks are not willing to loan them any more money because they're not credit worthy. We've reached that point. We've reached the limits to debt and therefore one of the limits to growth. Uh, another limit is uh, world energy supplies, and this could be a very long discussion, but I'm going to make it very short. Briefly, oil is our most important energy source, and just as U.S. oil production reached its peak in 1970, it's been declining ever since, world oil production is going to do the same thing. Ultimately, uh, everyone agrees, the only question is when. Uh, the data suggest it's happening right now. World oil production has been stalled out since 2005. Uh, even with very high oil prices, and the nature of the oil industry is changing. This is what it looked like in, two, in 1930. This is what it looks like today when we're drilling in a mile or two or three of ocean water, producing uh, oil from very, very tight, low porosity reservoirs as, as in the Bakken Shale or uh, from uh, bitumen as in the, the uh, tar sands of, of Canada. The costs uh, at every stage along the way are much higher as we go from the low-hanging fruit to these, these uh, super low-quality resources. And even though production in North America is increasing right now and probably will for the next few years as a result of the increased uh, investment in production from, uh, from uh, low-grade alternatives, even that is, uh, is likely to peak out around 2020 and, and recommence its decline. So globally, uh, oil prices um, are very high, as I said earlier. And they, they need to be in order to justify production of alter these alternative low-grade sources. But we know from recent history that every time oil prices go too high, that causes the global economy to go into recession, to move in reverse. So that's a second uh, break on world economic growth, and it's a serious one, it's, and it's being taken increasingly seriously by economists. The third, of course, is one that was studied back in 1972, which is uh, the, uh, the environmental impacts of industrial activity. And of course, that shows itself in terms of climate change, weird weather, droughts, floods, fires, and so on, but also in terms of industrial accidents, as we are going to the ends of the earth and drilling uh, ever deeper for lower grade hydro hydrocarbons, accidents happen and when they happen, they, they cost a lot to clean up. 
This, of course, is the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico in, in the summer of, of 2010. In 2010, the cost of industrial accidents and weird weather uh, to the insurance industry was about $250 billion. Two uh, that was 2010. 2011, we passed the $250 billion mark by June. So this is a, a, an exponential increase that we're seeing in uh, direct cost to society from these kinds of, of uh, events and accidents. And of course, that's not even counting the sort of slow ongoing costs from uh, air pollution, uh, soil degradation, and, and so on. So in the face of the end of world economic growth, this is, this is going to be a ver very big deal <laughs> because every nation has set itself up to depend upon economic growth for its health and well-being. Uh, in the face of the end of economic growth, the entirely foreseeable end of this, this treadmill, what, what do we need to do? Obviously, we need to build resilience in our societies and our communities, uh, which is the ability to absorb shocks and continue to function. We know that shocks are on the way. We need redundancy in critical systems, uh, dispersed system control points. Another way of saying this is localization. We need to run the movie of globalization in reverse in order to make our communities uh, more resilient. And we need to do that with regard to food systems, transport systems, and just about everything else. As we do these things, we have to keep in mind the potential benefits because uh, we need something to move toward and not just uh, some horror to, to react to or to attempt to avoid. And what we can move toward is all of the things that we've actually had to give up in order to have more economic growth a more of a sense of community and artistry and, and um, uh, a sense of happiness and, and health uh, uh, personally and, and communally. All of those things are, are attainable without increasing consumption or GDP, but we have to start planning for them, measuring them, and, and seeking to attain them. If we continue simply to measure and, and, uh, and aim for increases in GDP, first of all, our efforts will be frustrated, and second, uh, because what we're aiming for is something that actually is, uh, is making life worse for us in many tangible respects anyway, uh, even if we were to succeed for a little while longer, we would only make the problem worse in the end. So that's just a little framing to start our day. Thank you so much. Thank you.